Self-supervised learning is one of the most interesting developments in deep learning. The future of learning features from high dimensional data like images, videos, or text will not require human labeling. This unlocks the use of data sets like all of the images on the internet, all the videos on YouTube, or all the scientific papers that have ever been written. Of the self-supervised learning algorithms, contrastive learning has really taken off with papers like SimCLR, MoCo, or Bootstrap Your Own Layton. So what's the most important contributor to the success of contrastive learning? Is it negative batches, momentum encodings, or online clustering algorithms? This paper shows that the Siamese architecture is the core component of this. It's a great inductive prior to complement the prior of data augmentation and the idea of being invariant to small changes like rotations or increasing the brightness of an image. The paper also presents a really interesting K-mean style explanation of how contrastive representation learning works. This video will explain the ideas in the paper. This video will explain one of the latest experimental papers on contrastive self-supervised learning, exploring simple Siamese representation learning developed by researchers at Facebook AI. The contrastive architecture explored in this paper is named SimSiam, short for Simple Siamese Representation Learning. The idea is to take an image X and then form the two views of the image by using data augmentation, such as rotating the image, flipping the image, or altering different color channels. Then you have two different encoders, which is a Siamese copy of the same network. So the core component of these Siamese networks, these two tower neural networks, is that it's a copy of the exact same neural network with the exact same uh, parameters or weights. So after you take the output of f of x1, you then use the predictor multilayer perceptron network H that maps from f of x1 into a similar representation with f of x2. So there's this extra prediction that goes from mapping from the encoder of the one view of the image into the similarity with the other view of the image. And this similarity is usually a cosine similarity loss where you have some kind of dot product between the vectors normalized by uh, like the length of the vectors or the magnitude of the vectors. So the key component here and the experiments are going to show that this is really the core to making contrastive learning or these uh, Siamese representation learning algorithms work is to have this stop gradient when you're applying the loss function back to the encoder f of x2. So f of x2, these uh, weights don't update with any kind of gradient with respect to how it's encoding f of x2 only the f of x1 and the projection of h of f of x1. One of the interesting questions with Siamese architectures and contrastive learning is how come the representations don't just collapse to the same constant output? Say we have a bird image, a dog image, and a car image, maybe the network will just collapse to producing the same vector representation regardless of the input because it maximizes this loss function of maximizing similarity. So in the simple Siamese representation learning paper, they're going to explore these different techniques like how SimCLR, uh, MoCo, Bootstrap Your Own Layton, or the suave clustering algorithm, how they try to approach this problem of avoiding this collapse to a constant representation through different architectural changes. In the end, they'll show that all you really need is just this stop gradient that avoids this gradient going back into the negative or the alternative view encoder. There's no negatives in the sense of using uh, some other image sampled from the batch. So say you have a bird image and this is a rotated bird and this is a horizontally flipped bird, you don't need to use also say a car or a dog or those kinds of negatives that you would use in a lot of these contrastive learning algorithms. This image depicts the contrastive learning framework proposed in SimCLR. SimCLR was a really popular paper when it came out for self-supervised representation learning and this framework is really popular and has been really successful. It's the same idea of taking an image X, forming two different data augmentations by sampling from a set of augmentations, capital T having these two different representations, a projection head, and then uh, this, this is kind of like the feature extractor, and this is the projection head, and then you maximize, say, the cosine similarity between these two vectors. So the key in SimCLR, what was presented, is saying that larger batches is how you get this to work well. So say you have uh, one dog image, and then you have the rotated dog and the horizontally flipped dog, and then you would have a large batch of, say, uh, cats or other kinds of dogs, maybe, or cars, trucks, these kinds of things, and then you have this info uh, noise contrastive estimation loss, where you have this, uh, on the top, you have this exponential similarity term between these two augmented images, and then on the bottom, you have this normalized sum over all the similarities with the entire batch. So in SimCLR, they're saying that scaling up the size of the network, scaling up the size of these batches, is the key to making this contrastive learning algorithm work well. The SimCLR paper presents that large negative batches stabilizes this contrastive self-supervised representation learning, 
but say you're doing your experiments on a Google Collab GPU and you don't you can't run a negative batch of 4096 128 by 128 images so for that reason the momentum contrastive encoder paper was developed where you have this momentum encoder as a more efficient way of doing these negative batches but in addition to having a more efficient way of storing these negative batches where you just have this queue of the vector representations rather than passing the entire high dimensional images back through the network you also have this uh, lagging update of the network so these are momentumly encoded which means you have this uh, this lagging weight on the weights of the neural network as they're being updated in the encoder. So this might be the encodings from the neural network, say at four uh, training steps ago, not the most recent version of the encoder. So you have this idea of the momentum encoder where you have this lagging update of the network, and then you also have this more efficient way of storing the negative targets. Another approach to contrastive self-supervised learning developed by researchers at DeepMind is bootstrap your own latent. The BYO algorithm is very surprising that this works at all. You don't use any negative samples, so all you would have is the rotated dog and then the horizontally flipped dog that are each passed through these two different networks. So in the case of a similar kind of Siamese architecture, except in the similar way as the uh, MoCo algorithm, this is an, a lagging version of the same network. So it isn't a Siamese network in the sense that they share the exact same weights, but rather this uh, red network is a lagging update of this online network. So in the BYOL framework, all that happens is that the online network is predicting the output of the target network. And they also use this stop gradient operation where there's no gradient that flows back through the lagging update or the uh, momentum encoder of this online target network. So it's really surprising that this BYOL algorithm works with respect to that idea of avoiding representation collapse because there's no negatives to kind of stabilize the uh, output representation and not have it all just be the same representation because that maximizes this loss function of similarity. Finally, we'll look at the suave clustering algorithm for contrastive self-supervised learning. So this idea is to use one view of the image to predict the cluster or to compute the cluster exactly, and then you predict which cluster assignment from the other view of the image. So the way this really works is first you encode all these images into their vector representations, and from these vector representations of the original image data set, you compute the clusters. Or say you have uh, 512 of these image vectors, you could construct, say, eight clusters that you know, cluster the data and are the vectors that represent this set of 512 image encodings. So it would use the other view of the image to predict the cluster assignment rather than trying to maximize the two views directly. But the idea is that each view of the image should help you predict the exactly computed cluster of the other one well. So it's another way of uh, structuring this contrastive learning framework, in this case using this online clustering, and in other cases using this uh, momentum encoder or using large negative batches. But the core idea in Sims, uh, SimCIM is that you don't need any of these negatives, you don't need uh, the momentum encoder, and you don't need this clustering algorithm. All you need is this simple framework and then the stop grading operation going back through the Siamese copy of the encoder network. This image is a unifying view with the simple Siamese architecture with SimCLR, Bootstrap Your Own Latent, and the suave clustering algorithm. SimCLR also maximizes dissimilarity in addition to similarity, and there's a gradient that goes back through the other view or the negative encoder. So gradients go through the, uh, say, X1 encoder as well as the X2 encoder. In this case, you're also encoding a large negative batch. In the case of Bootstrap Your Own Latent, you're adding this moving average of the momentum encoder. So you're not uh, copying this network exactly. So it's not quite a Siamese architecture where this network is exactly the same as ne this network. Rather, this is a lagging update of this network. And then in the case of the suave clustering algorithm, use this Sinkhorn knob way of uh, organizing the uh, negative encodings, or I think it's just a similar way of doing X1 and X2, but you have this structure of clustering and predicting cluster assignments. And then you have this other algorithm, the Sinkhorn knob of organizing these kinds of batches because you're doing this in an online clustering way, avoiding trying to have this intermediate step of uh, update and then cluster, update and then cluster. So you have this additional complexity to the algorithm. Whereas the simple Siamese architecture, it's gonna perform better than all of these in their experiments. And it's much simpler than these other algorithms. The authors provide an explanation for what's really happening in contrastive learning, the real optimization problem at hand. So they relate this to the k-means style optimization problem. So in k-means, you start out with a cluster of data points and you originally assign these two centroids, the red dot and the blue dot. Then you compute the similarity of all these points to each of these two centroids. Then you form the two new sets 
and then you compute a new cluster based on the sets. So you'd use these red points, which are the most similar to the original red centroid, to compute a new centroid. And then you keep doing this until you've separated the two data points. So the point is that there is this interleaved optimization where first you compute the centroid from the set and then you compute the set from the centroid and you interleave this until you've clustered the data and computed the centroids. So the relationship with contrastive learning and this representation learning is that any data set, say it's an image data set and you pass it through a neural network, it computes this, uh, vec this matrix where you have a vector representation for each of the images in the data set. So you interleave these steps of uh, optimizing the parameters of the network and then assigning the exact points in this kind of space. So it's a little fuzzy. It's not like an exact one-to-one -one mapping with k-means and just it perfectly explains it in my opinion, but you still have this kind of idea where you can imagine that in this analogy of representation learning where you're unfolding the ball of paper, the theta maybe is un unrolling the paper and then the eta is trying to figure out, okay, where do these uh, data points fit on this new kind of representation landscape defined by theta? This table is showing the comparison of the simple Siamese architecture with SimCLR, Moco v2, Bootstrap Your Own Laden, and the Suave clustering algorithm. You see that they all perform about the same with these different settings of how long you're training them for, and then the checks to know whether they're using negative samples for contrastive learning, or whether they're using a momentum encoder, this kind of uh, running target average of the network. So you see this simple network performs just as well as the other ones, which is really surprising. This is another table showing the results with transfer learning. So in this case, uh, the first table of the downstream task is image net classification. And here are these representations, as you have these uh, image feature vectors that come out of these, say, 128 by 128 by RGB images. And now you're using those feature vectors for different tasks, like uh, semantic segmentation, or I think actually, I think this one's Coco instance segmentation, or just the bounding box kind of uh, object detection. And you have this kind of precision score around how well the RCNN is able to use these image features to then predict the bounding box for these downstream tasks. So the important thing again is just seeing that it's performing just as well as these other architectures despite having a much simpler architecture. And the key idea being all you need really is this stop gradient operation going back through the X2 encoder. The core takeaway I got from this paper is the role of this Siamese architecture as an inductive bias that complements the success of data augmentation really well. So we have these data augmentations that we know a dog is still a dog if you rotate it or flip it or slightly increase the brightness of the image. So those data augmentations have been proven to be really successful with image classification, all these different computer vision tasks, and even some uh, data augmentation is being used for text classification and miscellaneous other domains. So this kind of data augmentation prior is one of the most successful inductive priors that we've come up with as a deep learning uh, research community. And this Siamese architecture is a really interesting complement to the data augmentation. It's the similar idea of cycle consistency, this idea of having this explicit structure that helps complement this idea of the network should be invariant and have a similar prediction to this kind of idea of rotating it or flipping it. So I also thought it's just amazing that negative pairs might not be necessary for this. You think that having this batch of negative pairs really would structure the loss function. It's hard to imagine maybe just the signal is so high dimensional and. You know, it's, I, I just think it's amazing that the negative pairs might not be necessary for this. And then again, I think it's really kind of ridiculous that the stop gradient operation, the simple architecture, is, has similar results as something like the suave clustering, which seems to have this really uh, elegant, sophisticated kind of way of clustering and then predicting the cluster. So I think it's interesting to see that just this kind of simple baseline, kind of this trend of saying X is all you need and X is a simpler version than all these moving part kind of algorithms. But it's interesting that just this stop gradient thing is as powerful as something like using a massively large negative batch or something like this momentum encoder in the MoCo framework. Thanks for watching this explanation of exploring simple Siamese representation learning. This paper really shows the importance of the Siamese network prior in addition to these data augmentations and these different views of the images or whatever data in this contrastive self-supervised learning framework. I think it's a really interesting paper and it definitely simplifies this kind of idea if you're looking to implement contrastive self-supervised learning for your own experiments. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.